bad arcade games don't usually get talked about a whole lot, certainly not in the same way that more high profile failures on consoles and computers get mentioned. There's a few reasons for that, perhaps. Arcade games tend to be simpler and don't exactly have a high cost of entry, so a bad arcade game is likely just going to be played once and then forgotten about. Indeed, a lot of the arcades most would perceive as bad ones are likelier to be ones that have been dredged up through MAME or elsewhere rather than actually played on the floor. That and a lot of the bigger companies have an option to just not release a game fully if it doesn't do well on the floor. If you had the luxury of being able to do location testing, you could send a prototype out to an arcade and if it didn't do well, the decision might be made to just bin it then and there, rather than start producing it in any quantity. Something like Atari's Marble Man, the long lost sequel to Marble Madness, would be an example of this happening. There are certainly a couple of arcade games that get a bit of a knock, of course. Most would agree that Spy Hunter 2 and Double Dragon 3, for example, are largely awful sequels that completely miss the mark when it comes to what made the original titles any good. Some other titles might not necessarily be too bad mechanically, but are somewhat cringeworthy in their presentation. Revolution X isn't a particularly bad example of a rail shooter at all, but the concept of saving Aerosmith from a New World Order type organisation is quite the hilarious one. Something like this would probably also apply to a lot of old Laserdisc games. And then you do have whole legions of games that simply tried to rip off whatever title was popular at the time. A whole load of poorly made clones of the likes of Donkey Kong, Frogger or Space Invaders that aren't awfully notable beyond being poorly made clones. For this vid, I've ended up with a mix of titles that fit into these various categories as well as the odd one that goes a bit deeper. Some of them are pretty high profile while others are completely obscure and there's a couple that I've even got a bit of a soft spot for, as opposed to the ones that are just completely hideous. I've got around 10 or so, and we should probably start with a title that tries to give fans of one of the late 70s and early 80s biggest bands a sonic and visual experience like no other. And uh, it fails, but it does so in a very amusing fashion. Hello. I always love it when I get the chance to play Journey on a stream. The questions just seem to fly in from all angles, most of them simply being, why on earth is there an arcade game based on Journey? I suppose you could also ask the same question of games like Frankie Goes to Hollywood and Revolution X, but something about there being a game based on Journey really ends up being a head scratcher for some people. I mean, what, the guys who wrote Don't Stop Believing and Any Way You Want It? those guys? <laughs> really? But in any case, it exists. Largely it exists because Steve Perry, Neil Shon and company were all big video game fans and were well up for getting involved. This arcade game isn't even the first title based on the band, seeing as Journey Escape on the Atari 2600 predates it by a year. But this title is much more famous, or infamous I suppose. A March 1983 arcade released by Bally Midway that takes a similar form to Tron, their highly successful arcade based on the movie, and was designed by Marvin Glass and Associates, the old toy company who made a few games for Midway, including Tapper and Timber. The most notable thing about Journey is, of course, those big old heads. This was the first game to feature digitised faces, and their implementation was surely quite impressive back in the day, even if they do look quite ridiculous now. The technology behind these digitised faces was created by no lesser figure than Ralph Bayer, yes, the same man who made the original Magnavox Odyssey. Initially, Bayer's technology was going to be used in a game that was known as Clone. The title would have a special camera in the cabinet that would take your headshot so that you could be in the game. Unfortunately, the result of this was kind of predictable. During testing, some immature sod naturally decided to use this newfangled tech to make a dick pic. Clone was scrapped as a result, but the tech would be used in this game, with Bayer taking pictures of the band backstage at a concert. Funnily enough, and probably relatedly, Frontiers, the Journey album that this game was released to help promote, has artwork that's very much based on the box for the Odyssey 2, and said artwork also makes up a big part of the game's title screen. So as mentioned, this game is a lot like Midway's earlier Tron, although it's nowhere near as good. 
The band must fly their Scarab spaceship to five planets in order to recover their instruments, meaning that Steve Perry's got to get a mic, Ross Valerie needs to grab his bass, and so on. The minigames themselves are pretty simple and come in two parts. The first is usually some sort of obstacle course and isn't too hard, with Valerie jumping on columns or Jonathan Kane doing a rather simple reverse Donkey Kong type affair, etc etc. The second part is usually a bit harder. It's more of a shoot 'em up seeing as your instrument can shoot, naturally, and suddenly there'll be something like flashing sticks or records being chucked in your direction. In any case, you have to reach the line to get back to the scarab, instrument intact. The most frustrating part about the game is how big the band members' heads are. It's quite easy to misjudge them and graze them on an obstacle, meaning that you get to see Steve Perry or Steve Smith falling down and having a bit of a tantrum. All of these stages feature fairly simple but not awfully terrible versions of Journey songs. Fans will surely be able to spot the likes of Don't Stop Believing, Stone in Love and Wheel in the Sky on the soundtrack. If you do manage to retrieve all five instruments, you go to a special sixth stage. The band are in concert and you play as Herbie the Bouncer, stopping Journey's squealing fans from overrunning the stage for as long as you can. During this part, the band play their latest hit, and let's face it, greatest song, Separate Ways Worlds Apart. And it's the real deal this time, a cassette that would actually play inside of the cabinet, meaning that you'll need the appropriate sample in order to experience this in MAME. And then naturally, it all loops over on a higher difficulty. Ah, this game. It is undeniably very silly, even by arcade standards, and I've seen it featured on plenty of worst arcades ever lists. But I cannot say I hate it. I'm partial to a bit of journey after all, and this game achieves a certain level of corniness that fits the band very well. That and I've played plenty worse arcade games than this one, believe me. It certainly wasn't a successful game at all, but bearing in mind that this came out in the spring of 1983, right at the time when the bottom was about ready to fall out of the arcade business in North America, there is perhaps bigger factors in play when you consider the game's lacklustre commercial performance. Mind you, it is an arcade game based on freaking Journey of all things, and it probably wouldn't have done all that much even if it had been released a couple of years previously. Still, I get a kick out of it. While we are on the subject of arcade licensed games, let's go to a much more traditional subject of such affairs, a certain caped crusader. Batman games are usually big deals, especially when it comes to the various titles that were based off of the 1989 movie, nearly all of which were very successful and well remembered, whether it's Ocean's computer game that helped sell the Amiga 500, or Sunsoft's beautifully made NES and Mega Drive platformers. Even the PC Engine game is cool, if also rather weird. However, there's one platform where the Big Black Bat didn't make much of an impact, and that's on the arcade floor. Hell, I didn't even know that there was a Batman arcade game until a few years ago. More than that, it was a game made by Atari. Naturally, I was curious, fired it up in MAME, and quickly discovered the likely reason why I didn't know anything about this Batman arcade game. Because it's pretty bloody dull. The arcade Batman didn't come out until April of 1991 and it didn't have that big a release. It only ever came out as a conversion kit and only 600 or so were ever made. In another world, an arcade game based on Batman may have been made by an entirely different company. A recent Time Extension interview with former Konami artist Masaki Kokino revealed that the company did try to obtain the arcade rights for Batman but were unable to, presumably because Atari had got there first. This would have been during the time when Konami were rightly going nuts for licenses to arcade games with spectacularly profitable results. They could have probably been trusted to do a pretty good Batman arcade with the excellent Batman Returns beat-em-up that they eventually released on the SNES a couple of years later, maybe being a decent indicator of what a Konami arcade Batman would have looked like. The Atari game, by and large, is a generic side-scroller. Think of the Sunsoft Mega Drive game only far more simplistic. 
Most of your time is going to be spent punching and kicking various thugs, although you do get pickups in the shape of batarans, gas grenades and the grappling hook, and the various stages, all based on the movie's major locations, are broken up by a quick journey in either the Batmobile or Batwin, where you try to blow up the Joker's vehicles in a style that's kind of like road blasters, keeping a multiplier going for accurate shots and not missing anyone. The driving parts are probably the best bit because the side scrolling, eh, it just feels dull for the time and the animation is lacking. It's not utterly incompetent as far as side scrollers go, but it don't exactly dance with the devil in the pale moonlight. Eh. Awkwardly shoehorned in references aside, the game does have the good sense to include lots of speech samples from the movie, so you can expect plenty of I'm Batman and so on but that doesn't do too much to make the game feel any more than old hat. However, it's still surprising that the arcade game isn't better known. It is a Batman title after all, and this is a time when people would have happily bought Jars of Guano if it had a Bat logo on it. There seems to have been a bit of a delay. It's got a 1990 copyright, but again, it didn't come out until April of 91. Did Atari not have the time or budget to give it anything more than a conversion kit release? Or were they just not confident enough in the game's quality to give it any more? Eh, hey ho. The Atari Batman never got any kind of home port, although I would say that the Atari Lynx Batman Returns, one of about 20,000 separate games released for that movie, is a definite successor, as it does have similar cookie cutter side scrolling gameplay. Castlevania may well be a first ballot Hall of Famer when it comes to series of platformers, but it doesn't always hit the mark every time out. There's certainly the odd few games that, at the very least, divide people, whether it's Simon's Quest or the various 3D Vanias that were on N64 and PS2, games that do certainly have their fans amongst the detractors. And of course there's a few obscure ports kicking around that block the copybook a bit, even if they were probably done by a solitary person who had three weeks and an LSD freak's hazy recollections of the original to go on. And even with all these things considered, the very worst game in the Castlevania series is still, unquestionably, Konami's own Haunted Castle. If anyone ever asked the question whether Castlevania would be a good fit for the arcade floor, this game answers it with a thoroughly resounding no. A game that's right down there was one of the worst Konami have ever put out, certainly from their more classic period. Some folks will even try to pretend that Haunted Castle isn't a part of the series at all. I mean, it's got a different name and everything. It's just, you know, a lot like Castlevania. Alas, that's not the case in Japan, where it is called Akomeji Dracula. Mind you, it didn't start out life as a Castlevania game. Once again, Masaki Kukino has revealed some details about the project over the years. Kukino and some others were working on an entirely unrelated Konami arcade called Hot Chase when the company's boss, presumably Kazkazuki himself, ordered them to go on a mission of mercy and help out an original horror platformer of unknown identity that was, by all accounts, a complete mess. The decision to switch the game to a Castlevania title was made very late on, with the whole thing having its graphics changed accordingly and being beaten into shape over the course of a single month. Scarcely any time at all, in other words. The final result is quite the ugly affair. Everything's certainly bigger because it's the arcades, but the graphics lack any charm whatsoever and the Conanified, muscle-bound Simon Belmont is not a pretty sight. You can kind of tell how rushed and botched together the whole thing is, I'm afraid. With this in mind, it's rather annoying that a lot of Konami's marketing, including classically corny western flies with real people, as was their wont, tried to position the game as a remake of the original, when there's nothing in common beyond Simon, Dracula and a few recognisable enemies. Still, that's not the worst thing. That would be the stupidly unfair difficulty of it all. Now, naturally you would expect a Castlevania game to be rock hard, but the game does do some evil things. In particular, it only allows you up to three continues, which is ludicrously cruel. Now, it's not uncommon for arcade games to stop continuing in the final level, titles like Shinobi do that for example, but this? 
It limits you the whole way through. Three continues and only one life in each of them. It's not like this is a golden age type game where continuing would be kind of pointless. It's a multi-stage platformer that's got a bit more length to it, but the chance of most people actually making it to the end is pretty minimal unless they're willing to chuck coin after coin in in order to get good enough to get through the six levels. Absolutely evil. If you really want to get through the title, if you're some kind of Castlevania completionist, there are some things you can do to redress the balance. Firstly, don't play the American version. The North American release is way harder than the Japanese one, although the Japanese one does also have limited continues. Either that or you can futz around a bit with dip switches to stop every attack taking out half your bloody energy bar. You can also use coins to increase your energy bar, although again you can only do this a couple of times. But if you would rather just play with one big energy bar then eh, go ahead. I do believe that some versions actually do allow you to give the bar a boost through each of the three credits too, which again may help. There are some odd things the game does that changes the usual Vania formula. Simon can actually upgrade to different weapons, like a morning star and a sword, and bosses are generally easy seeing as you usually get the ideal sub weapon for them just before the fight. I suppose this is also the first Castlevania game to reuse famous tracks, with Bloody Tears making a deserved second appearance. Generally speaking, Kanichi Matsubara's music is of the Vania standard and is worth checking out even if, honestly, nothing else about the title is even worth a slight look. Haunted Castle stayed exclusive to the arcade until 2006 when it got a budget Japan only release on PS2, little more than an emulator, the ROM and a few extras, but it can also be found in Konami's Arcade Classics Anniversary Collection. I'm afraid that Taito's now going to come in for a bit of a kick in. I have mentioned this one a few times before, but I can't not include Nastar Warrior or Rastan Saga 2 in this selection. The original is such a marvellous game, the best Conan title there's ever been even if Taito weren't able to get the actual licence for it. So with that in mind, just what on earth happened here? How did they manage to make such a pig's ear out of the sequel? It's not as if it's even that different to the original, it's still the same mix of slashing and platforming, but everything about this game from the graphics to how it controls is so much worse. I've always found this game to be somewhat baffling ever since I originally played the Mega Drive port and found it to be shockingly terrible. I seeked out the arcade original thinking that it might just have been a bad port, but no, it's actually quite accurate seeing as the arcade is also a complete misery. Nastar Warrior, or simply Nastar if you're European, actually takes place before the events of the original game, being the story of how the barbarian warrior got his name by saving the kingdom of Rastania from a wicked group of demons. It appears as though a fair few people who worked on the original Rastan did also work on this title, although that number doesn't include Yoshinori Kobayashi, the Conan loving driving force behind the first game, and I think that might have been important. On the surface, it's a bigger and better sequel, where everything from the man himself to all the enemies have had a significant increase in sprite size. But when you compare this game to the original's graphics, <laughs> it's not even close. This game may be bigger, but the graphics are so much plainer and less detailed. While the original had these really defined outdoor levels with dramatic skies and enemies that really looked the part, Everything about Nastar feels lifeless and amateurish by comparison. Again, a crucial member is missing. Toshiyuki Nishimura was the lead artist on the original game and responsible for just how striking Rastan still looks to this day, and he didn't work on this sequel. The poor graphics however are nothing compared to the botched controls. Our hero moves around so sluggishly it's as if he can barely carry the weight of his overblown pectorals. And then, to top it all off, the jump in comes with an inexplicable second of delay that makes any platform sequence so much harder to time and gives the impression of a game that's not even finished. And again, we are comparing this to an original game where the controls were tighter than a nun's you know what. 
Rastan may have the same abilities. He can switch from a sword and shield to claws or a bigger blade, and he can also augment his abilities with potions and magic. But it's just not the same, and the much less memorable levels that mostly consist of mindlessly smashing blocks and stultifyingly over long boss battles don't exactly help. Every single thing about Nastar Warrior is so much worse than the original, making it the exact opposite of what a sequel should be. The third game, multi-screen hack and slasher Warrior Blade, may be somewhat derivative of Golden Axe, but thank heavens that it was a return to form for the barbarian kin that could at least partially wash the taste of this abomination out of arcade goers' mouths. A somewhat different subject now, arcade games and the UK. As far as original creations go, there's not exactly a whole lot of famous ones. The high majority of studios over here was content to just create computer games. There were a couple of exceptions, mind you, one of them being Century Electronics from the early 80s. Most Century games were cheap and cheerful, fitting into the not very good clone of a better game category, and were also sold at a low cost thanks to their CVS system that allowed operators to switch games in and out of a cabinet pretty easily. Still, they are responsible for Hunchback, which is one of the few arcade games from the UK to receive any recognition at all, both in Europe and in the States, where it was actually quite successful. I have seen people here and there take lumps out of Hunchback in the past, particularly Americans, but personally, I think it's a fun enough pitfall type game, even if it is somewhat behind the times even by 1983 standards. But I'm not really here to talk about the original Hunchback. Instead, I'm going to look at Century's two attempts at following it up, because they're much, much worse. The first Hunchback sequel, from early in 1984, was called Hero. This stands for Hunchback Esmeralda Rescue Operation, and it's nothing like the old Activision game of the same name. Instead, it's a maze action title where you have to pick up trinkets and avoid obstacles, from fireballs to the more usual arrows fired from off-screen. Basically, it's a much more simplistic and way slower version of Konami's Tutankham. And I really do mean slower. I don't know what's happened to old Quasimodo, but you will forgive me for saying that he's had a few too many vats of beef bergignon before taking on this adventure, which is to say that he moves like a friggin' escargot. The original Hunchback played a lot quicker, which was part of the appeal, and even if this still has that amusing garbled death cry, it smacks of a very hastily knocked together game that tried to capitalise on the original success, but failed totally. <laughs> And it wasn't the only one. Old Quasi might have been a bit embarrassed by his sluggishness in the last title, so he's got himself trained up and fighting fit. Good thing too, because he's taken part in the Olympics. Yes, here's Hunchback Olympics, and as you might expect, it's a track and field clone. Now you might wonder just how you could further simplify a game like track and field where you just hit buttons a lot, but Sentry actually do manage it here, so credit for that I guess. It doesn't seem too bad when you just do the 100 metres, but as soon as you get to the long jump you see that the angle metre doesn't even go up normally, instead moving in increments of 10. The discus is here too, but even that's simplified. It plays exactly like the javelin and shot put, and you only need to find the correct angle. It's better than the previous title, if only because it's a bit of a giggle to have Quasimodo doing athletics, but still not much to speak of. Funnily enough, this one did end up getting a port to microcomputers as Hunchback at the Olympics, while Hero never left the arcade floor. Needless to say, neither of these games helped Century make a lasting business out of Quasimodo games. They failed, and Century itself went bankrupt only a little over a year after the original Hunchback came out, wrecked both by the lack of a successful follow-up and the depressed state of the arcade scene. I 
have a few others that warrant a bit of a mention, but I'm going to run through them a bit more briskly. First up, here's something from the golden age that most people tend to bag on. Sanritsu's Dream Shopper from 1982. A pretty simple game that runs on Namco's Pac-Man hardware. As straightforward as some of these games can be, Dream Shopper seems to miss the mark for people probably because it's just so repetitive. It's a game where you simply press the button to reveal tile after tile in order to achieve a target score, trying to avoid holes, bombs and other near-do-wells, and occasionally going through a maze that appears to be made entirely out of the letter C. It's a maze game without much of a maze to speak of, and it's not exactly something that's going to stick in the memory for a long time. It is the classic example of a very old and not very good arcade that probably wouldn't be known at all nowadays if it hadn't been found in the annals of MAME. That said, it did apparently get a home port too, of all computers, the Sword M5. How about a couple of fighting games? One that tapes Mortal Kombat, and another that goes for Street Fighter. Sammy's Survival Art seems to be one that makes a few lists of bad arcades, even more so than other Mortal Kombat clones, although playing it I'm not totally sure what makes this a particularly terrible one compared to the likes of, I don't know, Time Killers. It certainly has big sprites and a bit of production value about it, although the game can be rather cheap and annoying. I don't know, it just felt rather boring as opposed to being especially hideous, but I thought I would at least give it a mention. On the much lower end of the budget spectrum, Best of Best is a Street Fighter clone that comes from the almighty Sun A, the finest arcade studio to ever come out of South Korea. This is a ropey game to say the very least, but <laughs> it's got quite a lot of plain old wacky charm. Maybe that's to do with the silly characters, or the special moves being called the Arts of Sure Killing. But it is at least a pretty easy Street Fighter clone to grasp. It's not good, but it's certainly enough to produce a good few laughs. I should also mention Kaneko's Blood Warrior here too. This is something of a mixture, a game with digitised sprites, but Street Fighter-centric controls, and naturally a lot of blood, kind of Japanese samurai movie style. It's filled with rather amusing characters based on Japanese history and mythology, and doesn't actually move too badly. I'd say it's one of the better Kaneko arcades, and certainly better than their more famous titles based on Jackie Chan. I had a jolly good laugh playing this recently with the folks from One Credit Reviews, and that's a video that you'll surely be able to see soon over on their channel. Finally, and sort of sticking with Kaneko, let's have a little venture to the darker corner of the arcade, the one that's filled with the million and one clones of Kaneko's Gauss Panic. You know, the game that's a lot like Kix, only you're slowly revealing a picture of a naked model. There's tons of these, but New Fantasia is always the one that I get the biggest kick out of. I mean, where else are you going to be able to have a match between Yasser Arafat and Robin Williams from Toys? Or have Robocop go against the Terminator in the only true contest between them? Where else can you play as Uncle Fester or Saddam Hussein? And get punished for being too cowardly with your pointer by having the picture of your model turn into freaking Pinhead? Naturally, there's a lot of the gameplay area that I am having to cover up here, but I don't know, this game is so spectacularly stupid that I can't help but have a bit of a laugh whenever I think of it. It is certainly better than Loverboy, which is the worst arcade game that I have ever played, and a game that I literally cannot show anything of beyond the title screen. That is a horror that you will have to seek out on your own, although I do not recommend doing so. Anywho, that's a selection of some rather strange, weird and bad arcade games. There's certainly plenty more out there, and this is a subject that could easily be revisited, but there's a lot of surreal fun to be found here beyond some of the arcades that most would agree to be Pretty Lousy or Double Dragon Freeze and Guardians of the Hood and so on. If you've got any others that you would potentially like to see looked at in the future, don't hesitate to mention them. But as ever, it's time for me to say... Bye for now.